All right, it's good to see everybody today. We're going out to the West Coast and looking at the Raiders today, the Raiders offense. Today we're looking specifically at their weapons and their tools, the wide receivers, running backs, and tight ends. Okay, so thank you for being with us. Everybody in the media this year, and perhaps some of the fans, if they make an assessment of the Raiders for 2020, are going to be screaming, hollering, jumping up and down, yelling, beating every drum they can beat to get a top flight wide receiver for this Raiders offense. Okay, last year, you know, heading into that offense, heading into that season, Antonio Brown was supposed to be that guy, and of course that turned out into a great fiasco, and we're not going to get into all that today. But we're going to start today, we will get into the wide receivers toward this second part of the video. We're going to start today with the strength of the Raiders in 2019 because it's very important as you look ahead to the 2020 season to try to make decisions about what the Raiders ought to be doing. The good news is you don't have a whole lot of free agents when it comes to this, this group of players right here. you got about five. Most of them did not get a whole lot of playing time in 2019. So you don't have a whole lot of heavy decisions to make here or a whole lot of shifting mass area when it comes to cap space. You don't have to worry about that. It's all decisions about do we want to upgrade the talent base or not. I want to start at running back right here. Josh Jacobs, of course, was a monster at running the football this season. What an absolute gold mine here. It's always fair to question whenever somebody has this good of a rookie season, is that something they're going to repeat? Because in the NFL, we've seen it before. We've seen guys who just had monster rookie seasons. Uh, I, I look no further than uh, on Johnson for the Detroit Lions had a monster rookie season. Not as good as what Jacobs had this year. But again, a monster rookie season kind of faded out in season two. But that's something we see all the time. You see guys have a monster rookie year and then kind of fade out from there. I don't think that's going to be the case with Jacobs. All right, but it is fair to keep that in mind and question that as you're developing your team and building your roster. But I think Jacobs is the real deal. He certainly looks like a guy who really knows how to get after it, really, really hungers to just get right in there and run the ball and run tough between the tackles. And that proved to be such a valuable tool for the Raiders during this past season. Only paying him $2.7 million, and he's under contract for uh, the next three seasons at least, depending on what you want to do with him in his fifth year. So Josh Jacobs, I've got him great as a number two, very good running back, even catches the ball some out of the backfield. This, this guy really looks good, and I don't think you're going to see much of a drop-off during the next couple of seasons. I think this is somebody that you can count on based on what we've seen. He certainly carried the load all through 2000 and 19. Behind him, you've got a couple of guys that are very interesting. I'll, I'll get to them in a second. Isaiah Crowell, this guy's a contributor. I don't think we've seen the best of what Isaiah Crowell could be in this league. I think he could have been better and may be better with another team in another offensive system. Don't know if we'll ever see that or not. He's going to be a free agent. I don't think talent-wise or snap-wise, snap count-wise, you're going to miss that. So I don't think, I would not expect Crowell to be coming back for the Raiders this season. You come back here to Washington and Richard, and I want to give something off here just to keep in mind. Uh, this video is being made in, in mid-February of 2020 offseason, so by the time some of you guys may see this in March, uh, you may have already seen three or four of these names change. I just barely caught, as a matter of fact, before this video, I just barely caught the Jalen Richard signing, and even that's a bit of an estimate, three and a half million dollars a season. But Jalen Richard and DeAndre Washington, both very good players. As a matter of fact, both guys, I, I like them. I, I really would not want either one of them to be the best running back on my team, to be the lead guy. But assuming Jacobs continues to be what he was this past season, they don't have to be. When you've got Washington and Richard can line up in the backfield as backups to Jacobs, you've really got one of the better backfields in the NFL when it comes to running back positions. Very, very strong position here. Washington and Richard. Problem is, both Washington and Richard were set to be free agents this, this offseason. And so really the Raiders did not want to try to pay both guys anywhere near what they might could make in free agency. No team would. So you kind of had to make a decision. Personally, I would rather have had Washington. I know the numbers were a lot the same when you look at you know the snap counts, uh, efficiency numbers. The numbers were a lot the same. They, they tend to catch the same amount of passes for the same amount of yards per catch. They, they tend to run about the same. I just like Washington better. I think he's a little more fluid. I think he's a little bit better fit. But the Raiders may have suspected that he was going to cost them more money. And so went probably with the cheaper option with Jalen Richard at an estimated $3.5 million. I got that off of uh, over the cap 
three and a half million dollars for Jalen Richards for the next two seasons. So I don't blame them at all for that. Even though I personally would rather have had Washington, I don't think there's a great deal of difference between Washington and Richard. And I think in view of the fact that I, I personally think Washington is probably a little bit better player than I think Richard probably was the cheaper option. Being running back, you don't want to throw a whole lot of cap space at the running back spot. There's just too many other spots that need that kind of money. And so I think that's why the Raiders did what they did. So expect Washington, I would think, to drift on off into free agency. And that leaves you with Jacob and Richard. Still a very potent one-two punch. And if at times you want to put them both in the backfield, you can certainly do that because they can both catch the football. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind there. Not many teams have a fullback who gets a lot of snaps. Ingold this year got over 200 snaps. Again, that, that's not a ton of snaps. But when you consider that a, a lot of people consider the fullback position to be obsolete in the NFL, and you see Ingold here getting over 200 snaps, you, you figure out that the Raiders actually used this guy with a purpose this year. And that was in the running game, trying to set things up for Jacob and Washington and Richard, and really just trying to do something that not many NFL teams do anymore. There's a few teams that do it, but not many. Using that fullback spot, he, he did very good at that. $588,000 is all he's going to cost you. And, and here's what's happening for the Raiders in 2019, and, and what you might still consider to, to be happening in 2020. Those of you who like to study strategy in historical wars, or those of you who come from the board game circles and you like to watch strategy develop in those board games, one of the things that you always see, and, and you see this in boxing too, those of you who have a love for boxing, when it comes to strategy, you versus an opponent, it is always about move and counter move. Position, reposition, position, reposition. And what we're seeing in the NFL right now is that almost all the teams have developed more comprehensive passing attacks. Their money goes into passing the football, and therefore the defenses over the past few years have put all of their money into edge rushers trying to get a lot of pressure on the quarterback and in trying to develop the secondaries. So the linebacker spots, the, the amount of time that linebackers are on the field has shrunk by about 30%. And you see the, the nickels and the dime packages on the field a whole lot more. You see a lot more uh, nickel cornerbacks and slot cornerbacks on the field these days, and a lot more secondaries. What that produces is an opportunity for, for teams like the Raiders to do what they did last year, and that is to run the football and run the football a lot and run the football off the middle. Why? Because most defenses are geared not only from a scheme standpoint, but from an actual talent and money and draft picks investment standpoint, most NFL defenses these days are geared towards stopping the pass. Okay, so just like a boxer would use a jab, or just like uh, you have all kinds of strategies that, that generals have used in wars throughout history, and, and just like they use strategies in different board games, such as Othello or Stratego, th those kinds of things what you're seeing the Raiders do last year is so, okay, okay we, we don't have Antonio Bryant up here. Matter of fact, we don't have that good of a wide receiving core at all. But we do have a guy here in Josh Jacobs who, who's getting better and better every week. So we're just going to keep running the football, passing the football to the tight end. And, and what that does, it, it allows the Raiders to take advantage of defenses that are built to stop the pass. And here they are now running the football right up the gut on teams that are built to stop the pass. And that served the Raiders well. It does a number of things. When you're up against high caliber offenses, and listen, that didn't work necessarily against the Chiefs because the Chiefs were just that much better, okay? But when you're up against high caliber offenses that might be better than yours, uh, what that does is slows the game down, keeps the ball out of the hands of the other team, doesn't give them as many times to try to possess the football and create that, those offensive opportunities, keeps the ball on your side of the field, slows the game down, and, and it just starts, things start to fall in your favor when you can do that. And the Raiders did that last year. And, and some people watch those games and say, well, wouldn't it just be easy to start putting in the big guys on the defensive line because you know the Raiders are going to run the football, and then wouldn't it be easy to just cram the offensive line and put eight in the box and stop the run? Well, there's two reasons why it's difficult to do that. One is that you have a pretty good quarterback in Carr lining up back there. He is one of the upper half quarterbacks in the NFL, so he's a little bit too good to just cram eight, seven, or eight in the box and just, you know, lead those wide receivers in one-on-one -on -one spots. He's really too good to do that, even with a limited wide receiver core. Also, what you start to see is because NFL teams, and this is important, over the past five to ten years, 
NFL teams have taken most of their money, most of their draft picks, and when it comes to developing the defense, most of the talent is in the secondary or in the edge rushing. And so the linebackers and the interior defensive linemen tend to be less talented and tend to have a lot less money and draft picks thrown at them, okay? So even if you do start to say, hey, we know the Raiders are going to run the football this week, let's put in bigger defensive linemen, let's put in more of our linebackers, what you essentially have is, instead of your top 12 most talented players on defense, you start to have some of these, hey, here's my 18th best player on defense, and here's my 20th best player on defense, and here's my 22nd best player on defense, all in the name of trying to get bigger and stronger, and, and now all of a sudden we're going up against the Raiders' strength with less than our most talented players just in an effort to try to match up. And so what you have done then, you have moved and counter-moved, and that's what the Raiders did. You look at the Raiders last season, they did not have a top-flight wide receiver, and yet still, we looked at this in the other video, the Raiders still had probably a top 11, top 12 offense last year. And the reason they were able to do that is because the running game was so strong, the tight ends developed, and they had a couple of wide receivers who could at least catch the ball to some extent reliably, and, and so when you look moving ahead to 2020, we'll talk about wide receiver in a second, it really starts to make you rethink about what do we actually need to do to make the Raiders better in 2020, and just how worried and how concerned do we need to be about getting that number one wide receiver. So with Ingold right here at fullback, with Jacobs, with Richard coming back, you've got that core there. The offensive line has a lot of age, but I think if you invest a couple of draft picks there over the next couple of seasons, you can continue to at least put together an average offensive line that will not hinder Jacobs and Richard and Engel from running the football and won't get too much pressure on Carr as the quarterback. Okay, we've talked about that strategy. Now let's look a little bit more about the tight ends. Waller had an amazing season last season. I don't think anybody expected this. Surely not. If Gruden expected this... If the offensive guys, offensive coaches for the Raiders expected Waller to have a 90-catch season this year, I would be very surprised. Matter of fact, and I can't even remember the veteran that we were looking at free agency last offseason for you guys, but my advice was last offseason that the Raiders needed to bring back the, uh, the veteran tight end that they had because he had a very good season, and I thought for the money it would be very worth every penny to bring him back. Turns out it wasn't. You had Waller here just come out with a, a career season. I think this is his fourth or fifth season. Had 90 catches. I, I forget if he had 90 or 1,000 yards in, in receiving yards. Just a tremendous season and was one of the better tight ends in all of the NFL last year. So really, this is back-to-back -back seasons now that the Raiders, with two different tight ends, have produced two of the better uh, tight end years for, for each, each of those seasons. Now, Waller is making $7.5 million next season, okay? Matter of fact, you've got him under contract for the next, I think, three or four years, and the cap number actually drops each season down to about $6.5 million, $6 million a season. It's fair to question, and again, I'm not trying to, to throw shade here. I'm not trying to criticize. It is always fair to question. Whenever you see a guy like this with Waller, he, he, was, he was fine in his first three seasons, but he was nowhere near locking down a starting job in the, in the NFL as a tight end. And then all of a sudden, he becomes one of the NFL's best tight ends this past season, and, and production-wise, just had a monster season. It's always fair to ask, can we expect that moving forward? We'd like to. We'd like to think that the light has come on, and we figured this out. He's a perfect fit for our offense. Him and Carr just get together perfectly. So we're going to keep on seeing this production. It's always fair to question, are we going to continue to see that kind of production? But... Even if you don't see him play quite to the level that he did in 2019, if you see a little bit of a drop-off, even if he just becomes a, a solid starter, just a solid lockdown starter, and not the incredibly good player we saw this past season, if that's all he is, at $7.5 million for cap pit each season and dropping down to $6.5, $6 million a season, you still have a very good value there. It's very much worth it, and, and, I, and I admire the Raiders for being able to pull this off 
that kind of a deal. You really don't see that kind of a deal very often in the NFL for a guy this, this age, and yet they've done that. So with Waller, if you can keep that production up, you have an absolute steal of a deal. Even if his production drops, though, to just the level of a solid starter, not a Pro Bowl kind of a guy, even if it drops at $7.5 million, you're fine. Down to $6.5 million, you're fine. You've got a good, decent value there. Behind him, Moreau had a very good season. I really like Moreau. This is a young guy. You're only paying him $707,000. I've got him marked as a three, a grade three guy, a guy who could hold down a starting job in the NFL. We haven't really seen enough of him yet to be able to say that, but he played very well this season. And it's fair to question, if we didn't have Waller, could Moreau actually step up and be the starter? And I think that's a, a strong possibility, con provided he continues to improve and develop. So right here with Moreau and Waller, You've got the tight end spot completely locked up, assuming that there's not a drastic drop-off and there's no reason that there, there, there should be. Okay, These guys are young enough to actually continue to get better and not have any kind of a drop-off. And the price is right on Moreau, $707,000 for a valuable backup who shows a lot of promise. And if you wanted to, you could go off into these two tight end sets, which, by the way, NFL defenses are not designed to stop two tight end sets any more than they are to design to stop running games with full backs and, and, and with running backs who are this good at running the football and with guys who can also catch the ball in the backfield. NFL defenses just are not set up that way. And so you are able, with these top two tight ends and with these three running backs here, the full back and the two running backs, you are very much able to start to take advantage. And they did that this past year to take advantage of how NFL defenses are built this right now. Carrier, um, coming back at $1.9 million, if you need to save money, you could let him go save about $2 million in cap space this year. I don't know that the Raiders are going to do that. I suspect they'll bring Carrier back. Tomlinson is gone in free agency. Do not expect to see him back this next offseason. Let's move over to wide receivers, okay? This, this, is the, this is the spot right here. Every media outlet you look at, just about, every one of them, whether it's a magazine or a TV show or you know, even, even a, a team website that you look at, is going to be screaming for a number one wide receiver. You're going to be suggesting all kinds of things, going out and getting somebody for a lot of money in free agency, going out and making some big trade for, for this wide receiver or that wide receiver. And you know, would it be nice to have a number one guy? Absolutely. But the thing you have to watch out for is you don't want to throw a whole lot of cap space at a number one wide receiver when you don't have to. Keep in mind, this offense this past season, built just like this, earned you about the number 12 spot in offensive production. You could run the ball, you could pass the ball, that very consistently, very balanced offense this year. The only, the only place that the offense struggled this year, and we, we covered this in the earlier video, was in the, the, the red zone. All right, They had a lot of difficulty actually turning those first downs into touchdowns. Okay, So that's something I, I think, as we look at the talent level, I think the uh, offensive coaching staff and the play calling just needs to take a look at, are we being aggressive enough in the red zone and being smart enough in the red zone? What's happening there in, in our red zone play calling scheme, okay? Hunter Renfro, rookie, had a great year, okay? In reality, he and Tyrell Williams had the same level of production, okay? Now, Renfro is a very different player from Tyrell Williams. Tyrell Williams is a bigger, stronger, faster version of a wide receiver, closer to what you would think of as a number one or number two wideout. Hunter Renfro is your classical slot receiver. Think Danny Amendola, Wes Welker, that kind of a, of a mold right there. But the production level was the same and will probably continue to be so. Um, I did not really like, and again, I'm not trying to bash the Raiders here, just expressing an opinion. Did not like the Tyrell Williams signing when I heard about it last offseason. You're paying a guy here who has not shown the ability to even lock down a starter spot in the NFL. Does he have talent? Yes, he has talent. Have teams developed it fully? Maybe not. We have not seen Tyrell Williams really step out and even show himself as a lockdown starter, much less an elite wide receiver or very good wide receiver. We just haven't seen that, and yet he's making $11 million a season, which is probably, in my mind, way too much uh, for what I would be willing to pay Tyrell Williams. The production level for Renfro and Williams is the same. Now, now Renfro is a steal of a deal because he's still on his rookie contract, so he's at $664,000 next year, which is absolutely nothing. So you start to see that the difference in a free agent 
who's making a lot of money and probably too much money for the production he's shown in his career versus a rookie who's actually outperforming his rookie deal by a good bit. But needless to say, if you have Renfro and Williams, you at least have, and you don't even pay attention to the cap for a moment, you at least have two guys that you know can catch the ball, should be able to get you about 40 or 50 catches. The disappointing part with Tyrell Williams is this. If I'm paying $11 million a season for a guy who I got in free agency, I really want to see a guy haul in 70, 75 catches a year. Okay, That's what I really want to be seeing out of him, but the, I just don't think the ability is there or it's not been developed here with Tyrell Williams. Needless to say, though, you've got two wide receivers here who were solid and will help you moving forward. After that, it really drops off. Jones, Doss, Bateman, Harris, a couple of those guys are free agents, not paying a lot to anybody. If you wanted to cut anybody here at all, any of these four, any of these two guys, Jones and Aitman, you could do that. I don't expect the Raiders to do that. Doss and Harris, I'm sure, will be gone in free agency. I, I would not expect to see them back. If anybody, maybe Harris, I think you could probably get him back for a million, million and a half dollars. I would think something like that if you, if you decided you wanted to bring him back. What I'm really seeing here at wide receiver and this is the part not that concerns me, but the part that I just think the Raiders need to address, is you just have no depth at all at wide receiver. Plus, yes, you are missing that classic number one guy. So if I'm wanting to improve at wide receiver, and, and John Gruden can do this, I don't think with, with that 10-year, $100 million contract, I don't think he's experiencing as much pressure as, say, the Detroit Lions uh, coaching staff and front office is feeling up in Detroit. I think he feels like he's got more time to kind of see this thing through and build it right. What I would much rather see, if I'm the Raiders, instead of going out and just throwing a bunch of money, uh, throwing a bunch of cap space at a wide receiver, or instead of trading away some of my assets, my draft picks, and, and bringing in another wide receiver who, who's going to eat up a lot of cap space by trade, instead of doing either of those two things, I'd much rather just see the Raiders over the next couple of seasons keep putting some higher higher end draft picks into their wide receiving core. And that doesn't necessarily have to be a first round draft pick, although I think that would be a good investment. I think you could address this in the second and the third rounds as well and still expect to see start to see some more depth here and expect also to see somebody step up and take over that true number one wide receiver position. Keep this in mind. Williams, his dead cap space falls to virtually nothing next off season. So if after two seasons, man, he's catching 40 or 50, you know, catches a season and you don't want to continue to pay for that, which, you know, I didn't want to pay for that in the first place, but the Raiders did. If that's what you want to do, you can let him go next off season, but you're going to feel a lot better about that if you've invested some draft picks and you've got some guys who seem to show some promise. And I think you can do that in the draft and not be expecting necessarily to hit stardom, just guys who can step in and play. And I think that's what you need to see there for the Raiders. So be careful with that. You know, listen to some of you think, no, 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 we got to we got to go out and trade for somebody, or we got to go out in free agency and land a really big fish out there in free agency. I respect that. that. That's your right to see it that way. This is what I would do if I were the Raiders. Keep in mind, this past off season, they certainly had a very good offense, an upper half of the league offense. Move the ball up and down the foot, the field almost at will. Struggled in the red zone, even though they didn't commit a lot of turnovers. And they did it with this roster right here. Okay, so it just shows to illustrate that you can have a good offense in the NFL without even having a number one wide receiver. It also serves to illustrate that you can, based on today's NFL, run the football, throw to your tight end, throw to your slot receiver, and still have a very good offense. Okay, maybe not the number one offense or top five offense, but you can still have an upper half of the league, upper third of the league kind of offense. I think that's it for today. We've covered everybody. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a good day. Bye.